Hello everyone. Good morning. My name is Cassie Brunsveld and welcome to our lunch and learn session with teacher Nigel Carlisle. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to introduce myself and Nigel. Um, so I am the program and resource assistant here at Agscape. Um, I get to work with teachers such as Nigel, um, coordinating our teacher ambassador program as well as um, various events that we run here at Agscape. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and I will introduce Nigel now. So Nigel Carlisle is a secondary school teacher with the Upper Canada District School Board in Eastern Ontario. He graduated from Lakehead University in 2018 with an honors degree in geography and has brought aspects of environmental sustainability and stewardship into his classrooms for the past four years. His classroom has two hydroponic grow towers and a traditional vegetable and herb garden inside the school where teachers, where, sorry, students learn about growing and harvesting food. Through the Ontario Council of Technological Educators Conference in Toronto, Nigel was able to collect with Agscape and has integrated agriculture education into various programs around his school. He has used many of Agscape's teacher ambassador presentations and is a fan of the technologies and innovation lesson um, that which he uses to introduce his students to robotics in the agriculture industry. Students then build and program robots to complete agriculture simulations inside the classroom. So that's just a little glimpse at um, some of what Nigel has been doing and um, we are excited to hear more about what he's doing today. Um, so the reason we have Nigel here with us this morning is that he is the recipient of the award for teaching excellence in agriculture and food education. So every year, Agscape in partnership with Canada's Outdoor Farm Show, which is coming up in September, recognizes Ontario educators and their efforts and achievements in teaching students the importance of agriculture and food and empowering students to become food literate citizens. We welcome all Ontario teachers. They can either self-nominate or they can be nominated by someone else, by a friend or a peer. Um, teachers must use agriculture and or food information and materials, either virtually or within the classroom, in an effort to assist students in learning the importance of agriculture and food. Learning activities can include, but are not limited to, understanding the impact of agriculture and food on personal lives, the environment, the, and the economy. Um, innovative and interdisciplinary, dis player, oh my goodness, innovative programs are encouraged. So um, we will talk more um, at the end of our lunch and learn session today um, about how you can apply to this um, award for next year. So now I am going to pass it off to Nigel. Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm super happy to be here. Um, I know some of you who are teachers are still on summer holiday. Um, and just like I am, I'm in my I'm in the school. I was hoping to be inside my classroom today. But of course, uh, they waxed my floors yesterday. So I'm sitting in my office um, joining you today. Can we get that slide? There we go. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, this is me. Uh, same person here on the screen. I um, I'm involved in agriculture. I live in the community surrounded by agriculture. I don't live downtown in a city. Uh, that middle picture there is of one of my flower garden beds at home where I grow my own vegetables. Uh, that one was uh, squash, a little bit of mumble jumbo, lots of things going on. And on the right hand side is me at work in the summer. I work at a sunflower farm as part of the agritourism industry. and um, it's an, it was an eye-opening experience going from being surrounded by dairy cows and beef cows um, and crash crops to go, joining the agritourism industry last year and just opened my eyes to a whole other avenue of agri agriculture and agritourism. Um, so this year at the Sunflower Farm, we have 40 acres of sunflowers um, and I'm just kind of a, everything on the back end um, from maintenance and building things. So that's just a little bit about me. I am from Cornwall, Ontario, and I teach at Upper Canada District School Board. Um, I am the, my house is the last exit on the 401 before we hit Quebec. So give you a little perspective of where I am located. Next. So um, one thing I want to stress is you can take agriculture in any sort of classroom. 
So the picture on the left is the classroom I had for my first few years teaching uh, my green industries course here in the high school. And it was actually a second floor science lab. So the furthest thing from outdoors, it was north facing. So no natural light coming directly into the window. We do have a little bit of light indirectly coming in through those windows. Um, but it was a science lab. So those benches are installed and can't be moved. So I couldn't rearrange my classroom. I couldn't make fun desk arrangements. I had to work with what I had. Um, so it really shows that no matter what your classroom looks like, you can offer agriculture education. Um, last year, I was lucky. I got to move down into one of our old wood shops on the main floor. So I had a garage door and a loading bay and power tools and water hookups. I had a computer lab within my classroom. So I was really lucky that I kind of got an upgrade to a classroom on the main floor, a little bit more space to do different things. That middle picture there um, is just the plants that my students plant. So everyone gets a six pod um, little planting pack at the beginning of the year. Um, and I have tons of seeds. So I put out like a big buffet of seeds uh, and they get to go through and pick whatever seeds they want to pick, whatever they choose and they know maybe they know a cucumber so they're going to plant that cucumber maybe they know what an eggplant is maybe they're going to be daring and want to plant a hot pepper um i do require everyone to plant borage it is um a very fast growing plant and that's just to give them that hope because that plant will come up in about a week um i do have some grow lights that i just got at home depot and um i just hang them above my little planting area there and the kids have to water that their own plants and um, manage their growth of their own food. The right hand side and behind me on this side, um, not set up yet because it's not the school year, I have one of my grow towers. Um, the one in the picture was before I purchased the cage that goes around the grow tower uh, to support other vegetables, but um, I grow, we grow beans and lettuces and herbs, uh, tomatoes, anything. Uh, this year we're hoping to grow uh, kohlrabi and cauliflower as experiments in a grow tower. And I get some of these information, these ideas of what I can grow my grow tower from TikTok. Um, there's TikTok, Instagram, social media. And I'm just, I'm amazed at what other people can grow in their grow towers. Uh, they're live outside in different climates, but we're going to try to grow them inside. So I usually start these towers while I have this class in my classroom. And then about mid semester, once they start to produce stuff, I then move them into the front lobby of our school. So then everyone coming into our building sees what we're doing. They can see that it is accessible and they're able to grow their own food. And then they can also pick stuff off it. We don't control who accesses the food. Um, if you want to have a bean right off the plant, go ahead and pick that bean. Um, the breakfast program often uses lettuces. Um, they make a few sandwiches for some kids who need food. Uh, the foods program, they harvest a lot of the herbs um, to use in their cooking class. Next slide. Um, and so then here's a few more pictures of just things that we do in that process of getting started. Uh, I realized after I submitted my little PowerPoint here that it actually goes in reverse. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so in the bottom, we can see that kids are uh, looking at soil. And that's one of the first activities I do in my classroom is a soil lab. Um, and this just gets a little science background. So any of you science teachers out there, here's how you can connect this to your curriculum. Um, we actually test the pH of a variety of different soils. So I go out and buy um, a few bags of soil, and which you're going to need anyways to do your planting. Um, I buy like, a pure manure. I buy a plant a vegetable plant bagged soil I buy a generic bag soil and then I also go out into my yard and just get a bin of soil um, from two different locations I've got a very fertile area of land and then I've got a very sandy area of land probably around like a septic tank or around the edge of the house and I don't label the bins so you can see in the middle picture there at the bottom that there's four yellow bins I know what's in each bin uh, they're labeled A, B, C, D, and the students uh, test all the different soils and they determine from a chart um, what soils best to grow their vegetables in. Then on the bottom left for me, um, they get to plant their little plants in there and they put them under the grow lights with little labels and they manage those plants throughout the year. Um, so that 
to chase them from semester beginner to end. By the end, they usually have plants they can harvest, they can eat, they pick away at them. Um, some students are a little hesitant to try their own food because they don't understand that the food is just grown like that. They think it just goes from the grocery store and they don't think it's safe to eat. And I'll just go over and break off a piece of lettuce and just eat it and go, it's safe to eat. And then they're like, oh my gosh. And they just get really engaged at that point. Um, holidays and um, weekends are sometimes a challenge when you're growing your own food. Um, in the beginning weeks, uh, all those pl um, plants have little domes over them, like little greenhouses, um, and depending on oxygen and water and whatever, some of them die right away, some of them survive, and it's a learning curve for the students to understand that there is that plant management, and I'm totally hands off at this point. I get them at each stage set up, but I don't water their plants, I don't maintain their plants, I don't remind them to water the plants, I don't remind them to check their plants, they have to do that on their own. Every day they complete a plant journal. Um, in the plant journal is just some basic information. What kind of plant do you have? How tall is it? Did you water today? Um, and just a little basic information. They're collecting data. They're collecting data so they can graph that data of the growth of their plant. They're collecting data so they learn where they went wrong. Oh my gosh, I haven't watered in five days because they stopped recording five days ago. I need to water that plant. And that just gives them that they're accountable for their action. They're learning, they're hands-on, they're being responsible. It also gives me five to 10 minutes at the start of every class to just talk with the kids as they're going to do their plants. I'm not starting my lesson that first five minutes, they're going to do their plants. And then we have a little conversation what they're doing. What's it going? Any challenges? What do we need to do? Is it wet? Is it moldy? Is there mushrooms growing in it? All those fun things. And then those other two photos there are of our grow tower and on the, top left for me. Um, we have a student uh, got her gloves and goggles on. She's actually testing the pH of the water before we get that system planted. So there's another measurement and science connection there. Um, so we do have to add chemicals into the water, nutrient um, and pH balance. And that's, we do that check. Uh, for the first week, we do it every day um, just because our water, we're using city water, um, it's chlorinated, we got to dechlorinate it, we got to do that, that whole process and figure out how to get that water to be balanced at the nice 5.5 pH level that our plants love. And then um, we can start planting and growing our plants. Now, as the year goes on, we need to add water. So we'll have to test that pH again because we're adding that chlorinated water right into it and we don't have time to dechlorinize it. Um, it does take two to three days for that chlorine to evaporate from the water. Um, it's not high amounts of chlorine, but it's enough that we need to make sure we're managing it on a daily basis. So the kids are registering that pH level and they're also calculating volume and concentrate as our pH and nutrients for our veggies and plants come in concentrates and it's so much uh, milliliters of the concentrate to so many liters of water. So we have that whole math portion in there as well. Um, so that's just some of the activities that my kids do um, in the agriculture growing their own food. Um, on the next slide, um, I, I, we go on some field trips. So uh, these were all pre-COVID, um, but I had it was given the okay from the school and the school paid for my bus and, and we went out to two farms. So we went out to a pumpkin patch and um, one of our EAs, it was her house, it's their side business, they have a pumpkin farm. And we were able to take my class of students from my green industries class and our entire special needs wing. So we have um, four classrooms dedicated to students with special needs. So we had about 15, 20 students in special needs and 15, 20 students of my own. And we went to the farm. Um, so we went to the pumpkin farm first and every student got to pick their own pumpkin. The, teach, the EA was just like, yep, they can all have a pumpkin. Um, so every kid got to go out in the field, uh, walk around, try to find their favorite pumpkin, grab that pumpkin and take it with them. The other photos were from their neighbor's dairy farm. Um, and this is a great intro into what I really enjoy doing in my classroom is robotics. So in that center photo there, we can see that little red, um, cleaning robotic robot and it was really cool for the students to see how this robot in action cleaning the barn and there wasn't just a person there shoveling all the manure and there's a little robot right driving around on the bottom left corner there's um the students are on a 
balcony, I guess we can call it, a raised area, and the farm owner is down below explaining this other robot that's an automatic milker that reads the microchips of the dairy cow so they come in and figures out their nutrients they need, their, their medication, um, and harvests that milk, collects that milk from the cow. This was a really great experience, and I, it, every year I try to get out and do a field trip of some sort. Um, COVID has put some restrictions on that. Um, we did have to move to virtual field trips, but thanks to Eggscape's virtual field trip um, activities, we were able to go to some other farms. We went to the chicken farm last year through Eggscape, and that was really cool. Um, something that I don't have a connection to a chicken farmer that will take me into their production. Um, so that was a really cool experience for them. Uh, last year, we got um, to go to a vineyard, uh, so specialty agriculture, and uh, we got a tour of the vineyard and the process, and the students helped with the harvest of the grapes at the end of the year. Um, so that was just after COVID, we allow they allowed us to go back and do that. Um, my plan for this year, um, the plowing match is in our region, so I plan on taking a bus or two loads two bus loads of students from our school um, to go to that plowing match and see the another side of the agriculture industry and a little few more other things that are going on. Next slide. So that robotics really brings me into this really awesome lesson that I do. And so what happens is my my we use the teacher ambassador program um, through Eggscape to introduce technology innovation in agriculture. Then I try to get to a dairy farm or a, a explore a farm virtually um, and see robotics in action. And then I bring the robots into my classroom. Now, like I said, I am lucky that I have a little computer lab of 12 computers in my classroom, uh, my new classroom, and I have a big floor space. So doing this is easier for me, but do robotics in the hallway, bring in some little laptops, iPads, um, you can code on a phone. Uh, we use the Lego Mindstorm EV3 kits. Um, and my students get to build a robot. Now I show them how to build the basic one, but I don't show them how to build all the additional features. That's for them to explore and find out on their own. Um, so they get to use block coding here and they um, have to figure out how to get their robot maneuvering around this mat. So they start in either what called the alpha base or the beta base or in one of the corners. And there's different challenges for them to complete on this farm simulation. So, um, most common one is they start this base and they go and collect hay from the field and deliver it to the storage area. And they have to code their robot to uh, move from the starting point to a different location to collect items and drop it off somewhere else. And they get points based on how many blocks of hay they move. Did they go outside the boundary? Did they run into a wall? Were the, was the robot able to return back to the base to start the next task? Now, I bought this mat off a of Spectrum um, education supply a few years ago. It's no longer available. It's discontinued. Um, and it's really unfortunate because it's a really great um, mat for these robots. But you can make your own mat. Uh, you can make your own thing in your classroom. Um, our elementary teachers have old shower curtains with uh, grids laid out on them. And they put different things in different grids. And that's how they do their robotics. Um, and I've, I, before I had this mat, I had just a big sheet of paneling um, with some PVC pipes hot glued to different areas and tape and the little cubes. Um, so if you can do whatever you whatever you have access to. I, I was able to get this when they still had it. They have other mats. Um, they're not agriculture themed, um, but I bought the agriculture themed one was available and that was how I created this one. So it's a really great connection between Eggscape's teacher ambassador program field trip, real learning, and then doing it in the classroom. And it really shows these students that agriculture is not just about um, going out on the farm. There are these other jobs like coding and making robots and designing robots to complete these tasks. Next slide. I don't think I have a next slide. I think that was it. So that's a little bit about what I have in my classroom um, and some of the tasks that I do around agriculture. It is a green industries program, so there is a few other aspects um, involved as well. I do a little bit of floristry. So this year, um, I also plan on bringing in, I made some connections with the florists and some local growers to talk about that horticulture industry that's still under the agriculture. It's a specialized agriculture, uh, but it's not the traditional dairy cow. And then we do some landscape design as well in my class. That's awesome. Sounds like you have lots and lots of different things going on and a wide variety, which um, do you find that that makes it even more engaging for your students that 
you're able to include like, you know, now you're doing the horticulture, the florist, your egg piece, the robotics. How do you find that your um, students engage when you have that wide variety? Yeah, so they, they really they engage in one of the different aspects. Um, so three years ago, this program didn't exist in my school. And now there's a waiting list to get into the program. Um, there, there's so many kids that want to come in to have all these different options. They're not just doing the same thing over and over again. Um, it's, and I always tell the kids, you might not like this activity, but the next one you might. You might not like the next one. And if them come up with one of the activities that I do that they're really interested in. That's awesome. So um, if teachers, anyone watching, if you have any questions you want to ask, um, feel free to do so. Um, I have come up with a few questions myself. Um, so Nigel, can you talk to us um, and share like what sparked your interest to bring agriculture and food education into your teaching? I was thinking about this on my drive into the school this morning and I was like, why didn't I never make this connection before? In uh, Pack of Ed, I took a, actually pre-Pack of Ed, my bachelor's degree, I took a course on permaculture, ag permaculture um, and the t it was only there were only six of us in the class and we went and explored a sheep farm and this guy's farm and that was the first spark of like oh maybe agriculture is kind of interesting to me and then when i was at octi i think it was 2018 and i met um eggscapes uh, at there then it was like okay well there's actually programs and supports for me in my classroom for this agriculture and then we offered this program just let's give it a try we need another credit that we we can pretty much drop students in. That's how it was originally given. What what courses we never offered at the school and that would be a great opportunity for these students. And then I took over and I was like, okay, well, what can I do with this? And just slowly started bringing in my community connections, the teachers I know, and just bringing it into the classroom. And it just all came together. The Eggscape piece, actually COVID helped with that because Eggscape wasn't in my area. We couldn't get a teacher to come into the classroom. So the COVID with online presentations, then all of a sudden I can bring Eggscape in and make that connection. And then the agriculture is kind of like exploded from there. And I wish I could just do a strictly agriculture course um, and then do all my other stuff on as a separate course. That's awesome. Very cool. Um, can you talk about the impact that agriculture and food education has had on your students? What have you noticed over um, the course of the time that you've been running these courses? What have you seen from the students or like just like the general school population? Um, this, I still talk to a lot of my students. My students are still really excited to show me the things that they grew. Um, I have a lot of kids who are like, well, I live in an apartment, so I can't grow my own food. I'm like, do you have a window? Like, yeah, I'm like, well, you can grow it in the window. We grew it in the classroom with no window, but you can grow it in the window in your apartment. Um, you can grow simple things like herbs and little little things that that fresh basil is much better than that store-bought basil after it's been sitting for a day. And I think we can all agree on that. Um, so that impact that the kids, the students understand where their food is coming from, that local food aspect, that they can grow their own food, that it doesn't have to be takeout or fast food all the time, that they can start a little garden in their backyard. It doesn't have to be big. It could be the size of a box. It could be in a Rubbermaid tote. Um, but that impact just keeps me going forward and wanting to bring new stuff in and show them new things all the time because one student's going to take that home and build a garden or start a hydroponic system in their house and that's the win for me that's where the students are like getting the impact from these classes well and going along with that have you been able to have some like cross-curricular connections like with like your foods and hospitality teachers because you have the growing towers do they use some of the stuff that you're growing and things like that? Yeah, the foods program uh, uses a lot of the herbs that we grow. Um, that's just something standard they use all the time where when we're, we got beans or something, there's like four or five beans. So there's not enough for them to do anything with it um, at that time. So that's usually what I just little snacks as kids are walking by it. Um, but I'm, I actually got a second grow tower this year. So I'm hoping to produce a little bit more and maybe we can go into producing, let's do a lettuce and then let's do a whole salad unit in the, that food and hospitality program. Let's do something that they've never seen before and teach them how to cook with kohlrabi. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, and then they can see that, you know, from, from field to fork, um, yeah. sort of whole, whole spectrum there. That's awesome. Um, so obviously, 
Um, you've talked about Agscape a little bit. Um, is there any specific programs or resources that you found helpful in your endeavor to connect students with agriculture and food that are that you found on um, our Agscape website and things like that? So I did do the business and agriculture course through Agscape many years ago. And that was the first, again, little spark of, okay, there's this business side of things as well. So the kid that's not interested in the farming aspect, maybe they're interested in the business aspect. That was a big resource for me to just get that, that understanding and knowledge. Uh, the teacher ambassador programs, I think I've done about 12 of them in the last three years. Um, and just every year I'm like, okay, we'll do these two this year. And I, I try to like change up what I'm doing and teach about more about local food and sustainability, or maybe I'm talking about, um, this year was the technology piece and bringing that technology innovation and connection to the robots. Um, those teacher ambassador programs have really helped me because I'm not a farmer. My parents were both teachers. I grew up in the country, but I don't live on a farm and I didn't work on a farm. So having that Eggscape person presentation coming into my classroom gives me, me that confidence that I'm doing something on the right path and the students have that specialist to listen to. It's not the teacher. Well, you're just a teacher. You don't know anything. I'm like, yeah, well, I, I know some things, but I do have bring these special guests or Eggscape's presenters, teacher ambassadors to do that. Awesome. Well, a little bit of exciting news, if you haven't heard already, uh, we are growing our teacher ambassador program. So we always had the 12 lessons for grade 7 to 12. We're now going to have 24 lessons for grade 7 to 12. So they're a little bit more specialized, um, broken down from grade 7 to 9 and grade 10 to 12. So we'll have lots of new stuff that you can use um, in your classroom this year, which is exciting. <laughs> I won't have to teach at all. I'll just have one every week and then right. you guys can teach my class. Great. <laughs> um, excuse me. Another question. Um, what are your future agriculture and food education plans? Anything you have exciting going on that's different this year? Or? I have goals and dreams and I'd like to get at least one or two of those um, in motion. Um, a few years ago, we built a greenhouse out of water bottles and that was a really cool project. Um, but it's been in storage um, because the school property is not that large. We're on a city block and the school and the football field take up the whole city block. Um, so I'm really advocating and trying to get some more outdoor space uh, dedicated to agriculture and food education. I've been looking at what how the spaces are used throughout the year and what spaces are dead spaces and not being used and how can we um, put an outdoor garden a community garden even that the community around our school um, can benefit from um, i would love to get some apple trees or some sort of fruit bearing tree on the property but again that's again looking at the logistics of where the tree going to go what about the future growth who's maintaining it in the summer um, Another one of our local high schools has an orchard of 14 trees and an acre plot of farmland that they maintain. Um, so like looking at their, what they're doing and how they're managing it, and then bringing that to my school, which is in a city versus that country school. So those are a few of my agriculture food education plans that are in the works. And I hope my principal is on here listening and uh, <laughs> maybe he gets a little hint hint and we can talk about it more. That's awesome. Sounds like some great ideas. Um, oh, it looks like there's another question from Jennifer. So I'm a kindergarten teacher and I have grown various greens with my students and allowed them to sample the produce. Um, I have also grown tomato plants, making numerous math connections as part of the, and I lost the rest of the question. <laughs> I'd also don't see the rest of the question. <laughs> I don't know if it got cut off. Um, well, would you like to comment to Jennifer on what she's doing in her class? And I think it's great. Um, <laughs> I do have a math teachable, so um, I try to bring math into everywhere. And um, so I, I do the same thing, right? Um, math uh, connections in my growing. So the kids get a ruler and they learn how to measure their plant and what is the height of their plant in inches in centimeters what is the growth over this week um okay so additional activity she can do with her kindergarten students so what you're talking about she can definitely do <laughs> definitely do yeah she can you you can like th those math connections the measurement um maybe you're counting how many tomatoes are grown on a plant um do all plants have the same number of tomatoes growing 
um, what that's that's looking at the yield, right? So if it costs me if you I don't know what your kindergarten is, I don't teach kindergarten. I'm a nine through twelve teacher, so the kindergarten expertise is very minimum. Um, but like, what does it cost to buy a tomato in the grocery store versus what does it cost to buy that plant? And then how many tomatoes do you get off that plant? Um, that's something that we look at in the high school side. Um, that see the bet bag of seeds, a little package of seeds, I wish I had a package of seeds in front of me, uh, is $2.99 from, I bought them, I buy them from Ontario Seed just because they get shipped to me right away. Um, and there are tons of seeds in there where that one tomato might be a dollar, right? Um, so look at that cost savings. Yes, there's a little bit of time and effort that has to go into it. Um, but anybody who has a garden at home knows that by the end of the summer, we're swimming in tomatoes and we're tired of looking at tomatoes. Um, so that financial aspect um, is a big component. That measurement aspect, um, graph them. How many how many tomatoes are red? How many tomatoes are yellow? Sort them. What kind of tomatoes? Are they cherry tomatoes? Are they plum tomatoes? Are they beef tomatoes? Um, all of these things are easy to do with a kindergarten student of categorizing them. Um, I don't really know much about the tomato sphere program, so I don't know. Um, other activities that are involved in that. That one's with Let's Talk Science, I believe. Um, I guess I can speak to yep. my kindergarten experience because I am um, a, a certified early childhood educator as well. Um, that's where I started off and then got my OCT certification. So um, other options could be, you know, drawing what they see, doing still life drawings, introducing that artistic aspect. Can they, you know, make that tomato plant out of play-doh or um, other materials that they have in the classroom um, talking about what can you make with the tomatoes and like doing like different science experiment things um, like make tomato soup or different things like that so definitely lots of different options um, that you can do there as well um I just, I just did a quick google search of tomato sphere oh. that's what I'm looking down at that um it does say in here like growing different growing mediums um so that's something i like i don't know if you already do but like the hydroponic tower behind me is in rock sol it's in not a uh, soil so can you what can you grow a tomato in does it have to be soil can it grow in sand can it grow in uh, paper bags like think of paper towel all play-doh i'm like what can we grow a tomato in? Uh, does it have to be soil? That would be a really cool activity. I, I don't know if you already do that. That just that was quick something while I was reading the tomato sphere. Perfect. Awesome. Um, another question for you. Um, do you have any comments or insights on how the agriculture and how agriculture and food education could align with the new science curriculum that's taking place? So I did look it up quickly when I saw you sent me these questions earlier because it's like new science curriculum. It's not very I'm regularly teaching. Um, I just saw connection after connection. Um, I didn't write them down, but I was like, everything that food education is, I personally, I think of the curriculum in the background. Um, and this is kind of, I want to, I'll do whatever I want to do and then figure out where it connects to the curriculum after um, because I know my students and I know what they're interested in. So I'm going to do something that they're interested in and make that connection for them. Um, but that connecting with the science curriculum, I'm looking at pH and measurement every day, every week, right? So that is a really great tie to that um, science. Um, looking at the food proportions, what nutrients and um, what sugar counts or whatever whatever that's a really big connection um i don't know i'd have to look up the science curriculum because again um i did look it up the other day um but maybe we'll go to the other question i'll come back to that one yeah for sure okay. um so april wants to know do you link agriculture to indigenous learning in your classroom hi april april's from my school board so i know who april is oh awesome um yes i do link agriculture to indigenous education in my classroom. So I am at a school that services the local reserve and we bus in six school buses of indigenous students into our high school every day. Um, so we also have indigenous staff on hand that are here to support us any means we can. So I do link the agriculture to indigenous learning in my classroom. Uh, we do look at the traditional uses of some of these plants 
that they have. Uh, so what is that plant used for in their culture? Um, and we have elders come in and do that because I am a white person. I am going to ident identify as white and I identify as Canadian. Um, and just with the population of Indigenous students, it is always best to have someone that they can connect with and that they know that is telling them the truth. So it's not me trying to explain to them what their culture is. Um, so I bring an elder in to explain all of those connections from what their traditional food um, is used from their their history of the corn or maize, the squash, how it's used in their culture, what are the meanings of it, um, and the, definitely those herbs and um, the uses of healing and medicine. Um, that's a big one, and that's that's really a big topic when we talk about indigenous learning um, agriculture in my classroom. But like you said, what better way than to bring in the expert, right? Bring in yeah. that elder that knows exactly all of the history and they can really truly do it justice, right? Um, yeah. Which is awesome. And it's so great that you have those connections and have those opportunities to do that because that just totally makes it even that much better. Yeah. So anybody, any school should have an Indigenous lead. Um, I know most of my Indigenous leads in our building. I know all of the, the Indigenous teachers in my building. I know the Indigenous principal. Um, making those connections because they have those connections to those elders to bring them into the school. Um, so they can connect you. If you don't know who they are, they will find them and bring them into the school because that's what they're there for. Awesome. Looks like Jennifer has another question. Um, the towers, yes, are pricey. So do you have any funding suggestions, um, like any grants or things like that? So when I got mine, I got it through the Green Apple Grant, which no longer exists, um, but it was $1,000 and I was able to get one. Um, Google searching. That's it. Got to look at what's your school board and what's available to you. Um, through the grapevine, I've heard that there's a cross curricular grant in my school board right now. Uh, that's going to come out in September for five thousand dollars. If I can connect any program to tech um, and have a project in mind, there's five thousand dollars available to me. And apparently, there's no limit um, to the amount of programs that a school can offer. So if I can connect that this Grow Tower project to the math curriculum or the science curriculum and team up with another teacher in my school, potentially we can get a few more of them. Um, so I did um, buy one of them with the base. So I bought the, uh, so I bought the base. So the center column in the base um, with that original grant. And then each year I've got something else. So part of um, the Eggscape award does come with a little bit of money. Um, and I did, go out and invest in purchasing something else. So I bought the cage. Um, I, I use some of my own money, yes, to purchase that, but that's just improving my program. So this tower um, is mine. There's another one um, that's in the classroom, but this one is mine and it's mine because it's all through grants and money that I secured. So it's considered mine and not the school owned where the other one's school owned. So this one stays in my office if when it's not in use. Um, and if I had to leave the school for some reason, this is going to come with me because I've done all the work to get this um, fundraising. Um, again, in my green industries program, we have a horticulture unit. Um, so we did uh, we did so many wreaths. I think we did 120 Christmas wreaths last year for the Air Cadet program. And I was made, obviously, I had to make some money off it as a fundraiser. Uh, so I made another thousand dollars by doing that program and it's able to purchase another thing for my tower or maybe just the general maintenance for that tower the chemicals and the pods um so i'm not just given these things there is work that has to go into them um your school might have a grant i know all of our intermediate schools were actually given this exact tower um, which is where the third tower in our building comes from it's in our intermediate wing upstairs um but every one of our seven eight wing schools or wings of our high schools through seven through 12 in our building got one of these towers so talk to your admin. Um, there might be funding available. There's probably an ex experiential lead in your board. Um, this is experiential learning. This is learning through hands-on. There is money available to you in your board. You just have to ask for it. And that's something I learned before I was a teacher because my mom was in the board. She was at the board level. She's like, just ask for money. There is money. You just have to ask for it. And you just have to know who to ask. Um, and one of my colleagues who I share a room with um, when I teach computers, uh, he's like, how do you get this money? I'm like, I just ask. I just, I, you just have to go and find the people and ask. He's like, but I've been told no so many times. I'm like, so have I. But if you keep asking the right people or different people, there's money available to you to fund these things. 
Um, I'm part of the teacher committee across the province um, through Eggscape and um, Randy up in Northern Ontario has an awesome setup and I wish I had his setup in my classroom, but he's also applies to grants. Um, Staples has grants, Best Buy has grants. Um, a lot of these big companies have grants and you just, you have got to be on the lookout for them and you got to be every week just searching for them. And that's, that's all only funding suggestion I can give you because it's all about you going out and finding it. It's not just going to land in your plate. Well, and like you said too, <clears throat> excuse me, the tech piece of it, right? There is so much out there to bring technology and that into the classroom. So um, hopefully Jennifer, you are able to come across some good grants and can um, introduce some of this tech into your kindergarten classroom. looks like April has another question. Uh, so she's teaching environmental science online. Do you think students could still do hands-on activities related to agriculture in an online setting? Yes. Um, so there's two options you can do for this. Um, depending on how the online course is run, if it's run out of your school or run out of the board, um, there's two methods we go. So during COVID, when we're doing online learning, I had this class to start and I actually packaged up seeds and things and the students came and picked them up at the school. So they didn't have to pay for them um, for the $2 it was costing me for the class or the kid per kid. Um, I sent that stuff home with them and they're still able to do that lesson at home. They're still able to do that planting and um, hands-on growing activity that lasted the semester from home. And that's something that you could do with an online is that could be their weekly check-in, send a picture of your plant. What does it look like? Um, growing something on their counter. That's super simple. If they are around the board, tell them to go to the dollar store and buy a pack of seeds and a thing, a little plant pot. They probably have a plastic container at home, a yogurt container, uh, recycling, using something at home, they can do that. And then you just have them do that hands-on activity and relate that back to you. Um, some of those coding activities, you don't even need the robots. You can run a simulation online, which still has that same connection. You can connect it to the environment. You can connect it that way, um, but they don't have to actually have the physical robot with them um, as an online class. Um, Eggscape, they've got lots of um, online activities. Um, there's lots of online websites and games. Some games are more childish, uh, like elementary, um, than the senior levels. It's harder to find senior level stuff. Um, environmental science looks at weather. How does weather affect crops, right? Um, those are some things that I can think of um, doing online. I'll think about it and I'll get back to you. Again, you're in the board, so I know how to contact you. <laughs> Well, and I feel like, you know, finding some of those items in your fridge, like fruits or vegetables, things like that, doing like some seed extraction or yes. different things might be another option. I love to try to grow the avocado and it dies three weeks later, oh. but I'm still trying. <laughs> Don't give up hope. <laughs> Don't give up hope. That's another great April, growing a seed, growing a seed in the fridge, cucumber. Awesome. Well, I don't think that there's any more questions. Um that's all the questions I have for you today as well. Um, so just quickly to um, talk about the the award that you won, the whole reason why we're doing this Launch and Learn experience. Um, so like I said, Nigel um, won the Teaching Agriculture Excellence Award that um, Eggscape has in partnership with Canada's Outdoor Farm Show. Um, so he won it for this this previous school year. So um, we are going to open up the applications again, beginning October 3rd, and they will close April 30th of 2023. Um, Canadian Outdoor Farm Show is going to sponsor it again, and it amounts to $1,500. So, you know, Jennifer, for that tower, there's $1,500 that you could potentially um, win um, through the whole application process and things like that. Um, if you want to have reminders or just get more information about Eggscape, what we have to offer, all of our resources, teacher ambassador program, things like that, um, be sure to sign up for our newsletter, um, follow us on social media. Um, there's lots of different ways um, that we can connect with you. I do see another question from Jennifer. Is Eggscape going to provide more lessons for primary grades? Um, so we do have like our online resource library, 
um, where we have some stuff for kindergarten. Our teacher ambassador program specifically is for grades four to six and then seven to 12. Um, who knows, maybe down the line, we will get down to that kindergarten um, grade level with the teacher ambassador program as well. But we do have lots of our online resources there. Um, other than that, I believe that is everything. So like I said, stay up to date, follow us on social media, follow our website, um, sign up for our newsletter so you can be the first to know all of the exciting things that are taking place. Um, thank you again, Nigel, so much for joining us today. Um, I know I got some really cool ideas and it seems like um, some of your colleagues and some other people who joined in got some great ideas. So thank you very, very much for sharing. And I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your summer. Um, crazy to think school is only two short weeks away, but enjoy those last few days. Thanks, Cassie. All right. Have hey there, Ontario teachers. Agscape is an Ontario charity bringing agriculture and food education into the classroom. Our teacher ambassadors work with you to indulge your students' curiosity about where their food comes from and explore innovations and technologies that go into modern food production. Our interactive lessons can be delivered virtually or in person to your classroom and are absolutely free. Visit agscape.ca forward slash request dash TA and book a curriculum linked lesson for your class to help create the next generation of food literate citizens.